Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Iris Iglar, president of the North Northwest Suburban Chicago chapter, the National Organization for Women. And tonight I'm pleased to welcome our very own Karen Korch, who recently attended the Conference on the Status of Women or the CSW at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Karen is a retired nurse who now devotes her time to volunteer work with several organizations and as a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association, she serves as the president of the board of directors at the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women, also known as the Inter International Women's Convocation or the IWC, uh, which brings together women who identify as Unitarian and or Unitarian Universalist who improve the lives of women and girls in their communities. The IWC is a member of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So let's learn more about the UN's annual conference on the status of women and why it matters to women. Karen? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks, can Iris. Can you, can you spotlight Karen? Let's see now. Um, all right. So I'm going to share my screen. So, um, the, so uh, the CSW was the 67th conference on the status, 67th session of the commission on the status of women. Um, so the commission on the status of women is the principal global, global intergovernmental body exclusively dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. A functional commission of the Economic and Social Council, which is usually referred to as ECOSAC. It was established by ECOSAC Resolution 11 in June of 1946. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk more about the ECOSAC status and what it means later in the presentation. Look here, this is the poster for the um, 67th CSW. And um, so the dates, it was from the 6th to the 17th of March. I was only in New York for the first week from the 6th um, to the 10th. And then I had to leave. Um, but some of our members were there longer. It, yeah, it's, it's quite a long conference and quite involved. A lot of things going on at all different levels. So the priority theme, like it says here, was innovation and technological change and education in the digital age. Um, and here it says progress towards gender equality. The full um, statement was for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And then they also, besides having a priority theme, they have a review theme. They take a theme from a few years back and um, look at it again and see how much progress is being made on that theme. And the review theme was challenges and opportunities in achieving gender equality and the empowerment of rural women and girls which was in the agreed conclusions of the 62nd session from 2018. So they, they took the, um, the conclusions from 2018 and reviewed them also during this CSW. So this is one of the organizations at the UN, um, UN Women, which is um, a part of the many layers and organizations. So the, um, for many years, the UN faced serious challenges in its efforts to promote gender equality globally. Um, they had inadequate funding and no single recognized driver to direct UN activities on gender equality issues. In July 2010, the UN General Assembly created UN Women, this organization. The UN, it's the UN's Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women is their formal name to address such challenges. In doing so, UN member states took a historic step in accelerating the organization's goals on gender equality and the empowerment of women. The creation of UN Women came about as part of the UN reform agenda, bringing together resources and mandates for greater impact. And then there's this organization called NGO CSW New York, which has been around for 50 years since 1972. And they have monthly meetings 
for the NGOs, which we are an NGO, and um, talk about all the issues related to CSW. So year round, we're always um, networking and talking about what is going on in the world as far as women's rights and women's equality. And um, this it's a very dynamic organization with groups from all over the world and a good way to, to keep up year round on what's going on. So this photo, I um, I I saw this photo in um, this a publication called Past Blue. It's PastBlue.com, and they're a, an independent news newsletter that covers the UN. And um, I received the newsletter. You can you can go on PastBlue.com and read articles about the UN. So they um, they took this picture and I th I was in this line somewhere. So this is when you were talking about how many people were there and the processes and things. I was in this line. So, but the reason why this picture stood out to me so much is because this woman right here, where I have my cursor, um, I met her. So what I think it was because this line swirled around and you know it was like being at an amusement park or something. We were like in line for hours and you know, passing different people. So I had been talking to her and she is part of an, of an organization um, called, where is it? Um, the International Federation of Medical Students Association. And so she's a medical student from Lebanon and I can't remember her name, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I did. But um, she also is a professional basketball player in Lebanon. <laughs> I thought that was really fascinating that she's a medical student and also a professional basketball player. I said, you must not ever get any sleep. So it was very interesting to talk to her. And I don't know a lot about sports, but then, you know, we got into talking about gender equality in sports. And she said, oh, you know, about football and the men's team in the U.S. sucks and the women's team, you know, is so good. And they just, you know, you know, recently received um, a big settlement as far as pay equity. And I said, yeah, that's something I do know about because U.S. soccer has their office in Chicago. And oh. I've, I've oh. been to protest at the U.S. soccer office in Chicago. You know, we did, um, we did pickets a couple times down there. Huh. So that was one thing I knew. And so when she started talking about that, I said, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that issue, the soccer mm -hmm. issue, because of, um, because of Chicago being where the national soccer offices, but um, otherwise, yes, yeah, sports are way out of my out of my mind. So, so yeah, I had a fascinating conversation with her. So yeah, this is this was a line, and I was in this line somewhere, and we stood in line for three hours. But I learned something very valuable. Um, I um, I should have come a day early. I had friends who came on Friday because they give out badges for the, U for the UN for CSWs, I think starting on Friday. And um, I could have come a couple of days early and, you know, went in the office, maybe got my badge and walked out. But yeah, you come on the first day of CSW and this is what it looks like. And yeah, we stood in line for over three hours to get our badges. But it's very interesting. They're very, um, cognizant of older people standing in line and I was with a woman who was in her 70s and they kept trying to pull her to the front of the line and she said she kept saying no no I have to stay with Karen so <laughs> <laughs> so and I mean it was her first time too so um so we stayed together most of the time towards the end they did pull her to the front and then she ended up um once she got her badge she sat on the floor at the exit waiting for me to come out. So, <laughs> but yeah, they were, they were going up and down the aisles and pulling out people who, who looked um, older to, um, to come to the front of the line. So that was very nice. I also met a Dominican nun while I was standing in line who um, it was her first time at CSW. She's, um, she's from Michigan, I guess. So a lot of interesting conversations while standing in line to get our badges. And here is a picture of some of the women from our group that attended me, me with my horrible posture. And 
<laughs> I know every time I look at these pictures, I'm like, I got to work on my posture here. Um, this woman here is Carmen. She's from Bolivia. Um, a lot of the women, this woman is a UU minister from New York, Carol. And a couple of women, Cindy, who was my roommate, and Ellen here are both UUs. They're also big in Veterans for Peace and do a lot of work with Veterans for Peace, which I um, I am a big fan of. So I, you know, spend a lot of time chatting with them about that organization. And this is Tina. She's originally from Germany. And so she br brings her unique German perspective to our group. And Julie from California and Genya, who lives in New Jersey. So we had an assortment of people um, from our group who attended CSW. So it was very nice to be able to um, get together because most of my, our meetings, you know, with our groups are online since we're all over the place. And here is another picture of us. And um, this gentleman, his name is Bruce. He worked for 25 years at the State Department as a diplomat. And then he left the State Department and worked for the Unitarian Universalist Association mm -hmm. for 15 years at this office called the UU at the UN. Mm -hmm. And the, the UUA decided that they want to focus on domestic issues. And they have, um, they closed their physical office at the UN and um, are not mm -hmm. focusing on those things. So Bruce retired and he, he um, works with us um, you know, as a volunteer, showing us the ropes since he has so much experience in the, with the UN and diplomacy. And this slide um, is from the opening session. This is Ms. Seema Bahus, UN Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN delivering her opening statement to the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women in the General Assembly Hall at the UN ed headquarters. So I have a picture of her and then a picture of what the hall looks like. This is the hall when it's empty. Um, uh, an excerpt from her remark, she said, a new kind of poverty now confronts the world, one that excludes women and girls in devastating ways, that of digital poverty. The digital divide has become the new face of gender inequality, which is being compounded by the pushback against women and girls that we see in the world today. That is why the work of the 67th Commission on the Status of Women could not be more timely or more critical. And um, while she was speaking, I was still in line at getting my badge. So I, we were watching um, some of her remarks on UN Web TV. So if you Google UN Web TV, you can see a lot of things that are going on at the UN if you, um, if you have an interest in that. It's kind of like C-SPAN. Sometimes there's some good stuff. A lot of times there's a lot of boring stuff. So <laughs> you have to um, choose wisely as far as what you want to see. Um, and this, um, like I said, there's the, the main um, sessions in the UN, and then there's what they call side events. And the side events um, are put on by um, intergovernmental organizations and um, permanent missions and um, different um, countries here. So this was put on by Liberia about um, the forgotten 200 million, um, about um, female genital mutilation. And this was, so the side events usually are held on the UN compound in conference rooms. And um, I did attend a fair amount of side events on all different topics, but this one was very, very enlightening. Obviously it's, you know, we, we would have hoped that we could have made more progress on this issue, but unfortunately it's still going on all over the world. And this is one of the uh, parallel events. Like I said, I'm, I think before people came on, the parallel events are, are the events put on by NGOs 
um, such as our organization is considered an NGO and they have their um, events off the, the UN compound. So they're in buildings up right outside the UN compound. Usually there's a building across the street where they have a lot of a lot of them, it's called the Church Center. And this one was being put on by a group called um, the Invisible, Invisible Girl Project. Um, I don't know if you can see that, it's, it says IGP. Um, they, um, trying to see where's my notes here. Uh, uh, yeah, the Invisible Girl Project is um, to address the missing girl issue in India. There are, approximately 63 million girls missing in India, you know, due to um, femicide related to um, the, you know, the culture of, of girls not being valuable to the family and the whole dowry situation, which, you know, a lot of these things, you know, in India, the, the dowry system is illegal, but Changing the culture is a lot harder, you know, than changing the laws. They have these laws, but they're not enforced. And so unfortunately, um, and the the laws about um, people, you know, it's big business in India for women to have ultrasounds to see if they're going to have a girl or a boy and um, if they're going to have a girl to, um, to abort the girl. And, um, and the other issue, they talked about um, these, midwife, whatever you want to call it, taking babies, girl babies, and drowning them in the rivers and things because, you know, these girls are so expendable. And there was, there was um, a, they were speaking about how some girls have a name that means unwanted in their language. And apparently that's common. There was somebody in the audience too talking about that. Um, I mean, that's how bad it is that these girls, um, are given na a name that means unwanted. So it's it's a very uh, difficult problem that they're tackling. And, and so um, I admire the work that they do. This is a picture of the church center across the street from the UN. And um, it's a very beautiful building. Um, the Church Center of the United Nations is a private building founded, owned, and operated by the United Methodist Church, and it's an interfaith space housing the offices of various religions as well as several non-governmental organizations. So it is um, right across the street from the UN compound, and um, it says it's a very, the chapel, which is right inside this facade, is a very popular place for wedding ceremonies, especially ones between couples of different religious or national backgrounds due to the, the interfaith um, style of the, of the chapel. Hmm. And the, yeah, the Unitarian Universalist Association had an office in this building prior to the pandemic, and now it's gone. And oh, did it? This slide, I guess, is not showing up. I, um, I didn't do this properly. Apparently, <laughs> um, these are the two, um, the two parallel events that my organization put on. One is about women with disabilities crossing the digital divide, and this one, which is not showing up on the page, is about um, a young women's network that was put together to um, for young women to around the world to network and, um, you know, guided by mentors to gain leadership skills. And so these women put together this, this presentation to show what kinds of things they had worked on over the past year for, through the program that we had funded and um, developed for them. So our programs were virtual. So a lot of the programs that just started after the pandemic too. Like I said, the, 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 in 2020, the CSW was pretty much canceled. The, the heads of state came together and made a few statements and it lasted a half an hour, an hour. And that was the whole CSW. And then in 2021, there was um, a virtual CSW. In 2022, there was a virtual CSW. So 
that became some, you know, a change because now it's hybrid and a lot of the NGOs like ours who couldn't afford to come to the UN and put on a presentation are able to put on presentations virtually. And so we did two presentations virtually. Uh, so yeah, so those are the parallel events. And like I said, there's a lot of them on virtual that are virtual. We use this app called the Whova app. I don't know if um, people have used that for other conferences. I've used it for a bunch of different conferences and um, it, it was very helpful too. And as far as the in-person meetings to try and find your way around where you were going to meetings. So then <laughs> moving on here, just to show you some sites around the UN. Um, on the Visitors Plaza, there's a lot of very nice artwork. And this one is called Nonviolence. It's a brown sculpture of a 45 caliber revolver with a barrel tied in a knot. Um, the gun is cocked, but the knot makes it clear that it cannot shoot. Carl Frederick Rootsward made the sculpture in 1980 after his friend John Lennon was, was murdered. And it was, obtained by Luxembourg and the state of Luxembourg donated it to the UN. And so that's how it ended up at the UN. Yeah. And this is another um, very fascinating piece of art um, on the Visitor's Plaza. It's called The Ark of Return, which was in, unveiled in March of 2015. It marks, it was, it was unveiled to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery in the Transatlantic Slave, slave Trade. The, the memorial located on the UN Visitors Plaza will invite people everywhere to contemplate the legacy of the slave trade and to fight against racism and prejudice today. Visitors can pass through the Ark of Return to intimately experience three primary elements. The first element, acknowledge the tragedy, is a three-dimensional map that depicts the global scale of the triangular slave trade. The second element, consider the legacy, is a full-scale human figure lying in front of a wall inscribed with images of the interior of a slave ship. This element illustrates the extreme conditions under which millions of African people were transported during the Middle Passage. The third element, lest we forget, is a triangular reflecting pool where visitors can honor the memory of the millions of souls who were lost. And um, you can go online and if you Google the Ark of Return, you can see videos to get a better idea of this sculpture because it's very complex and very beautiful. And this was on the Visitors Plaza on International Women's Day they handed out chalk. And so women were invited to write their thoughts on the pavement. So they didn't have any official sessions the, the morning on March 8th of International Women's Day so that they could do, um, you know, they had these activities like this. They had some dancing presentations, singing, and um, all sorts of pageantry to celebrate International Women's Day. And I thought this was pretty cool, all the different messages on the sidewalk. Like I said, I'm kind of all over the place. I know I'm, I don't know if I'm the best at organizing these slides, but this is another um, important element of the work that the UN does and how we um, focus our work. And these are the sustainable development goals. Gotta find here. Uh, so, um, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was the official name of this um, when it came out, adopted by the United Nations member states in 2015, which provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. So at its heart are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And this poster um, lays them out, you know, so that people can see what the focus is. Gender equality, of course, is in the top five here. And um, a lot of these are very intersectional. So all these things are important to women, poverty, hunger, good health, 
quality education, clean water. So um, a, a thing I thought was very interesting about the sustainable development goals is, you know, we don't hear a lot about them. And um, one of the women in our group, Tina, that I mentioned, she lives in New Jersey now. She's a university professor who teaches business. And she also um, works at a university in Europe virtually. She's not teaching there now. I guess she does administrative things. But she told me the difference between the way business classes are taught in the US versus how they're taught in Europe is it in Europe, they teach the sustainable development goals and how those should be integrated when people are, you know, creating businesses, doing business, et cetera. And in the U.S., you don't hear about that at all. So I was very, um, that was, it's sad to hear that, that, you know, they're doing this in Europe and we're not, we're not focusing on it because this is very important to the future of our world. Okay, here too, I messed up with the pictures. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll learn the next time I make slides, but this is, um, here, let me see what I wrote down. So this is Linda Thomas Greenfield when she is, was being sworn in as the um, US ambassador to the United Nations. And of course there's Kamala Harris who's swearing her in. Um, she served as the US Assistant Secretary for African Affairs from 2013 to 2017. And um, and then Joe Biden appointed her to um, to be the ambassador to the UN. Before that, she worked in the private sector. So um, she was sworn in February twenty third, twenty twenty one, and she took office officially on February twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. And then I have now as the last slide. I was trying to do some research or maybe it's not the last slide, but um, I was trying to do some research on what relationship now has to the UN. I don't think they um, are an NGO in consultative status with ECOSOC, but I did, I did read on the website that um, under the global feminism that they have um, been involved in um, the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And I saw that also that um, Christian Noonan had made a, um, a statement to the Human Rights Council about um, the femicide going on in Iran. So it seems like NOW's work primarily is with the Human Rights Council, which is based in Geneva. At least that's all I was able to glean from, from my research. Oh, and then, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, the CSW 67 agreed conclusion. Um, the, um, the principal output of the Commission on the Status of Women is the agreed conclusions on priority themes set for each year. Agreed conclusions contain an analysis of the priority theme and a set of concrete recommendations for governments, intergovernmental bodies, and other institutions civil society actors and other relevant stakeholders to be implemented at the international, national, regional, and local level. In addition to the agreed conclusions, the commission also adopts a number of resolutions on a range of issues. Let's see, exit the slideshow. So um, let me stop here. Um, this is, well, I can show you that this is actually the CSW 67 agreed conclusion. It's a lot, and it's a lot of, of um, you know, highfalutin language. So um, my eyes glazed over trying to read it all, but <laughs> so, but um, it is interesting to see, um, you know, what, is going on with that. And if anybody's interested in that, I can show them, them that. What else do I have in here? This share screen thing. Um, oh, I can move that toolbar, okay. Um, so this is where I got this um, 
information about now and their um their relationship with the UN. I saw that um like I said, there was a statement put out in November 22 about um the femicide going on in Iran. And then under global feminism, um talked about the gender shadow report. And this was in 2006 that now was working with the Human Rights Commission for their 87th session in Geneva. So those are the only things I know about now and, and what they do with the UN. Let's see. There's another. This is separate from the... Um, from the Commission on the Status of Women, but there's another forum called Gender Generation Equality, which is um, focused on young young women. And um, they met in Mexico, like it says here in 2021. And um, so that's another interesting organization to follow if you're interested in what the UN is doing, Generation Equality. So yeah. Um, I hope that that I spurred some interest in UN activities. I know that was a lot to put in a half an hour. So <laughs> it's probably too much, but um but yeah, there's just so much to um to learn and so many layers of of things going on at the UN. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Is that is that femicide in Iran, is that a new thing? Probably not, huh? Well, I think it's been ramping up from what, um, yeah. What would I mean, be but, what spurring it to ramp up? Making, what would, what would be spurring it to be getting worse? Um, I'm not sure. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah, because I know ever since, um, you know, because I, I know that's been going on a long time since the, um, since the, they call them the Islamic extremist, extremists right. took over Iran. I mean, that's was, was that the 70s or the 80s. So, I mean, it's been a long time, but I think that it's been, um, that there's been increasing tensions over there there must there must have been something that spurred um now to make a statement about it so yeah i think i haven't studied it thoroughly but i think for some reason yeah it has been getting worse hmm. the, the the revolt in iran has been particularly over you know what the the fundamentalists are doing with women and have done with women you know the slow oh, i think yeah the, the wo woman life freedom yeah was it the woman who was killed by police when she um she was accused of wearing her her headscarf inappropriately right. and she was um killed by the police and that set off all these protests and i think that's what what ramped up the the government's um increased um crackdown on women's rights so i think that that was probably that the the spark that that increased you know the violence going on in the state towards women any other questions well does the un i mean in situations like that does the un have any have much teeth is there much well, um, yeah, unfortunately not. I mean, the UN has all the same problems that we have at all other levels of, you know, diplomacy and politics. There's a lot of politics at the UN. And, you know, one thing that in the main sessions, one of the days I was there, each country gets up and speaks about, you know, their situation as far as human rights. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is just propaganda. You know, because you have these countries, you know, Afghanistan and Iran, and they'll come up and say everything is just so wonderful for women in their country. And, you know, it's not. So, so yeah, there's, it's, it has the same, you know, there's the same issues at the UN as there are everywhere else as far as, um, yes, Moira's asking if 
if I can email my slideshow. Yes, I definitely will email it to you, Moira. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is interested, but yeah, um, I can definitely email the slideshow. I did put some notes on the bottom of some of the pictures so that um, yeah. so that you can maybe see some of the links and what have you. Um, well, we'll, like we'll I, email them to everybody who registered, will you? Okay, all right, yeah. Because, um, yeah, like I said, some of the slides, I had like two pictures in there and only one showed up on the screen because I, I didn't preview it, how it, all of the slides, how they would look in the slideshow, apparently. Um, so, I so Karen, was it, was it people, literally, was every country represented or almost every country? How yeah, many? I think there are, so, um, yeah, almost every country. There was somebody, I think, was it Russia? Somebody was expelled from the con from the CSW. So they can expel countries, but like I said, there's, I mean, all these countries where you know women are oppressed, I mean, they're still represented there. So it takes a lot to be expelled from, um, I think because of what's been going on with Russia being so defiant, I think it was Russia that was expelled. Um, but yeah. Almost every country around the world is is represented. So did you make a lot of friends with, from people around the world? Oh, yeah, I met a lot of very interesting people. Oh, Moira's asking about international reproductive rights. Yeah, um, there was, a, um, no, there was, some, you know, reproductive rights was in, um, kind of baked into a lot of the things like the, the, um, missing, the, Invisible Girl Project in in India, you know, as far as the um, everybody wanting girl babies, and I mean some of it. But the theme this year was digital, you know. So so everything, you know, most of the programs were related to um, how the digital world is impacting women, and um, and some of it has to do with. Um, but I can't say I. I'm trying to think, I can't say I did, I did a lot, or I went to a lot of things that had a lot to do directly with reproductive rights. We talked a lot. Um, there was, I went to a program put on um, by some diplomats. It was a side event about the situation in Ukraine. And they talked about people, women fleeing Ukraine, and they were afraid to get on these buses that were taking them out of the country because they had been duped before apparently you know, that the Russians had come and taken women out. And so they were afraid to get on these buses, but they were getting into cars with people they didn't know because they thought that was less intimidating for them. And, you know, these people, <laughs> cars were human traffickers. So what this, um, or what they had, and I don't know how they developed it. My friend was asking me, well, how did they do this? I'm not exactly sure of the logistics of it, but this woman was was talking about how they developed these push notifications that they sent into Ukraine to women. So everybody's phone buzzed, you know, kind of like when you get a storm warning. And it said, you know, if you get into a car with somebody you don't know, take a picture of the driver, take a picture of the license plate, take a picture of the car and send it to your loved ones right away. So that was one thing that they were doing to try and stop um, human trafficking in Ukraine when women were fleeing. Hmm. So I thought that was very interesting. What were the highlights for you? For me, like it, it was my first time in person at the CSW. So just trying to get a feel for the whole thing. You know, like I said, there's so many levels of events, you know, these events put on by the different um, heads of state and then events put on by um, NGOs. Um, it was just a little bit overwhelming, just trying to soak it all in and figure out how it all works um, and, you know, doing it in person. I mean, just, it's just kind of feels surreal to go into, um, the big hall when they have one of these um, presentations where they have people speaking all different languages and you have your little headpiece and there's a translator <laughs> that translates everything into English for you. So, um, so yeah, just for me, you know, it was my first time. And so it was just trying to digest a lot of information and, and 
being how the UN works. Was and it all simultaneous translation? You know, was it the full simultaneous translation that you would have gotten like at a general assembly meeting? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, it depended on the, yeah, if there were high level meetings at the CSW, yes, they had the translators, yeah. The ones, the, the high level meetings. Otherwise, uh, most of the NGOs, um, most of the programs, outside of that were put on um, in English. Um, there, yeah, there's, so there's a lot of limitations. I know I went to one presentation by, um, it was about, it was a refugee organization in Australia and New Zealand helping women um, refugees. And so these women who had come as refugees years ago from different countries, um, in Africa and um, Malaysia, um, all different places that um, women had come from. And the, one of the questions was, you know, these women had been, they're now either permanent residents or citizens of Australia and they mentor the newer women refugees coming in, you know, so it's kind of like passed down to the next generation of women leaders to, um, to help the newer refugees coming in. And, um, you know, people ask why are the, you know, the, the people who are on the front lines who are newer refugees not here? And well, of course it's because um, those people are not allowed to travel. So they're not, you know, they're not allowed to come to New York. And I know, you know, within my own organization, you know, we've had those problems. We have, um, we have women in Uganda and Kenya that we work with, and we had the, the different conferences that we had trying to be able to get them a visa to be able to come to the United States. Well, it was impossible. We thought um, we had our co a, com a conference in Eastern Europe in Transylvania, and um, they were allowed to travel to Romania. So and this was before I was real involved with the organization, but what happened was whoever made their travel arrangements arranged for them to change planes in Western Europe and that they were not allowed to do that. So they never ended up in Romania. So all the times that we've tried to, um, to have some of our partners from Africa be able to come to um, our events, we haven't been successful. So there's just a lot of, you know, racism and um, in our immigration policies here, West in in Western Europe, and and it's it prevents a lot of, you know. So it's still about privilege and who's allowed to travel and who's allowed to to represent. So so yeah, it's it humbles you to think, you know, you always have to think that about how privileged we are to be able to travel wherever we want to travel, pretty much, and. Um, being American citizens, all the rights and privileges that we have. Um, it's very humbling to think about all the things going on around the world. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about um, the term digital poverty, which was, I know, the theme of the meeting. But I mean, what exactly does it mean? I mean, to me, it almost sounds like you don't have, I mean, is it really, you don't have the technology? Well, there's, I mean, yeah, some of that, yeah. So you don't have access to the technology. Um, I know a lot of people around the world now have, do have, have technology, but um, like in my own organization, in the um, International Women's Convocation, we, when we have our board meetings and things, there's a woman in Northeast India, and a lot of times she'll say their expression is the current is out. So she's like, well, the current was out, so I couldn't come. And, um, and in Africa too, and in the Philippines, you know, um, a lot of times we have to um, pay supplements to our board members who live in the Philippines because they can't afford to have the, um, the internet access that they need to come to our board meetings. So, so yeah, they don't have the same privilege that we have to have, you know, meetings like this and then their internet is unstable. And um, so, yeah, it's, it, it gives them a disadvantage. 
And is it more that happened with women? Well, yeah, yeah, especially, yeah. Um, you know, in, in most of our pun partner countries, well, in Romania, it's a very patriarchal society in Northeastern India, even though they have, uh, it's an indigenous group who are Unitarians in, in Northeast India. And they, their, their indigenous group is traditionally matriarchal, but in reality, it's a patriarchal system. The women don't have any power. They, they, the inheritance rights, whatever, you know, things are passed down on the mother's side of the family, but still the man of the family always, you know, controls things. So most of, um, you know, and in Africa, one of the reasons women can't get visas to come here either is because they don't have any property in their own name. In the U.S., when you apply for a visitor's visa, they want to know what kind of assets and things you have. And women have nothing because the way their society is set up, all the property, everything is in the man's name. So, so yeah, it's, 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 you know, so you have no control and yeah. And so as far as the digital, having access to digital stuff too, you're pretty much at the mercy of, of, you know, the men who control those things. I see. And uh, I know because me, my husband, he works with uh, Latin American countries, teaching and doing pro uh, programs. We here forget that n not everybody around the world has access to the internet uh, or has a computer or if they don't have, a, for example, have a, a cell phone but perhaps it's for the, the whole family. So mm -hmm. uh, the reality is uh, the access to technology and digital uh, advance uh, is not, uh, has not gone to everybody. No, not everybody has access and we forget because here we are used each one has a laptop, <laughs> at least in my family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that perspective. You know, oh, yeah, I like it. That really helps. Um, uh, are there any other questions? Or we can just speak up. So Karen, Karen, I didn't realize the Unitarians are so international. Tell us more about the international Unitarians. <laughs> well, they're going through a lot, the Unitarians as a whole, the Unitarian Universalist Association, like I said, they're going through a phase where they are trying to be more domestically focused. And so it's kind of like there's a lot of factions now, things are getting tense. Um, but um, so our group, our women's group is pretty much the only um, international group that's actively doing international work. Um, and which is why, like I said, Bruce, the the guy in the picture who is a diplomat and um, who worked for the UUA, he is working with us now and working for Community Church in New York um, be, he, because we're the only ones that can give him a pass to the UN because when he retired from the UUA, they took away his pass. And so, um, but yeah, the, the most of the Unitarians or the UUA, I should say not most because a lot of the people members are not happy about the whole situation. You know, they're, they're kind of um, dismantling a lot of their international programs, but they did have like a partner church council, which, um, so the, um, the Philippines, one Island in the Philippines, Negros Island had, has a Unitarian Universalist church of the Philippines. That's their headquarters. And, um, you know, it's a pretty small organization, but it was started in the 80s and it became part of um, the UUA. So they're um, a unique um, organization in that, you know, they have a different culture. You know, the flavor of their religion is a lot different than ours. You know, they're influenced a lot by the Catholic culture of the Philippines. So they're a lot more, um, you know, use a lot more of kind of almost Catholic sounding um language when they talk about their religion. So they have a different, you know, a whole different flavor than we do. 
But and then there's also the um, in Transylvania in the 16th century, this the Unitarian Church started during the Protestant Reformation. You know, this um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I can't think. There was a guy who was martyred for, you know, his um, his rebellion against the Catholic Church, and that's kind of how the Unitarian Church started. So in Transylvania, there's a um, big Unitarian Church, which is ethnically Hungarian. So it's actually they have um, Unitarians. It's called the Hungarian Unitarian Church, and they have Hungarians and Roma Romanians of who are ethnic Hungarians. So in Hungary and in Romania, there are Unitarians, and they're kind of the um, the forebears of of the religion we have in the United States. But they're much more conservative. They do have women ministers, but they dress kind of like like Catholic priests with the black robes and they say the Our Father. So they're, you know, much more patriarchal than we are and uh, much more traditional. And then, like I said, Northeast India too, they're, they're a more, those Unitarians have been around for a long time, but they're much more traditional than we are. So it's a little bit different to, but it's, it's interesting to learn the history of, um, of how we evolved to where we are here in the United States, the UUA. I imagine there were other uh, religions represented as well, organizations. Oh yeah, yeah. Where, you mean at the UN or? Yeah. Oh yeah, like I said, that church center was started by the United Methodist Women, that, um, that building across the street. And yeah, like I said, there was Catholic nuns I saw at CSW, there's, um, so there's people from, all different, you know, um, organizations that are involved with okay. with CSW and with all the things that go on at the UN. Okay. Um, well, we're getting close to the eight o'clock hour central time, and uh, I just wanted to uh, conclude. I just wanted to say a few things uh, about our future plans for chapter meetings. Um, our next chapter meeting is going to be held on Thursday, May 18th. Uh, wait, this is, yeah, Thursday, May 18th. And I'll be sending you an announcement about that soon. Also, uh, in June, as I mentioned earlier, Donald Bell of the um, National Organization. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Donald Bell of the. Uh, National Organization for Men Against Sexism will be speaking. Uh, he's agreed to speak on June uh, 15th. So he's gonna be here. And uh, I'll be sending out information on that on our um, MailChimp. But in closing, first of all, Karen, I really liked your photos. And um, I thought, you know, like that photo of the gun was amazing. <laughs> and. <laughs> um the arc of the was it called the arc the of arc of return arc of return that was beautiful um uh i'm i'd also i'd like to you talked about the agreed conclusions of the meeting and i was wondering if you could send me a copy of that oh yeah yeah curious and if other people want to we can send that to people yeah slides if they want yeah Oh, I, so when you mentioned the the um, piece of art, the gun, that's the most photographed piece of art at the UN, and there's a lot of art at the UN. Mm -hmm. And I actually I bought a tote bag that has that. Um, yeah, I got you. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a memory. Of, it sounds like memory of John Lennon. That's the rich. That's how it works. Yeah, that's why it was developed. Yeah, and but it's got such a strong world uh, message. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Let, let's email. We'll, we'll email um, the the slides uh, and the conclusions to uh, everybody. But that yeah, help. yeah, that would be great. And um, so I just want to thank you, Karen, for sharing uh, such important and interesting global information. And I also want to thank the participants for joining us tonight. And um, we are recording this, so it will be on YouTube. And um, I just want to say good night to everybody and have a good rest of the evening.